and have a chair or, or have a desk, whatever. <laughs> and um, Sherry got sick. And so then I taught the bell school for, oh, I don't know, six, eight weeks, oh, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I, at that time, I had the Klein kids, Brian, or uh, oh, yeah. Annette and okay, okay. Her, her children. So they were in that school district. Then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, and those are the only, and I guess because they were neighbors of ours, but those were the only kids that I remember having at that time I subbed, yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't a banana. Yeah, this really isn't a very big school. It looks like a bigger table. It's very small. Are you this thing or not? <laughs> now, when, when uh, I went to school here, there was one time that we had, or a couple of times maybe, we had 13. And I was visiting with Gwen the other day, and she said one time she had 15 in here. And I was always telling everybody I thought 13 was the largest that this school had ever held. And she said, no. She had 15 in here, and the first grader sat at the little table oh, up here. And I don't know how many she had, probably not more than a couple. And uh, <clears throat> so she said that she had 15. I was just floored because I didn't know that, I thought 13 was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Pretty good group in here because right now there's uh, nine chairs or nine desks in here. She can you get up. We be able to get up. We'll all help. I bet she can get up. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, it, yeah, you could crowd the bowl. Well, I guess you could add one to each end if you move everything back. And then you would have 12 there and maybe 13, 14, 15. If you I put suppose, yeah. How many did you have? I never had more than 13. And there were 13 a couple of times when I was a student here. So I always tell people I spent 11 years here and I didn't flunk any grades. <laughs> I mean, most of the, they promoted her past the second grade, so she always wanted to teach second grade because she got promoted from first to third. So she missed. My Aunt Gladys did that, too. She jumped a grade, I think maybe like third or fourth grade. And so uh, back then, they did that. Uh, that was no longer practice by the time I started teaching. Yeah. Whether you were the smartest kid in school or not, you had to take them one grade at a time. So my mother and my aunt had to ride their horse, ride the horse from the farm up to the city school. <clears throat> okay, as long as you brought a horse up. Uh, we had a horse barn that sat just about where the depot is, and it was red. So if you looked out this window right here, that's what you saw. Only half that height. I think they tied the horse to the tree. Oh, we had a we had a barn, nice barn. We played in there on cold or snowy or rainy days. It had a it had a, it had a dirt floor. This one's bigger. May I change my seat? You may change your seat. Usually, when they do that, you say yes. You may go to the restroom. <laughs> yeah, this one's bigger. Yeah, a little bigger. Um, and so the the red barn stuck right up. <clears throat> Between these two windows, uh, just about four feet out, was the cistern. So the cistern sat right out there. And of course, every fall, the school board boomed. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. What is that? <clears throat> I don't know. Wasp. The school board cleaned the cistern out and then filled it full of nice fresh water for the school year. And that, that lasted us all school year. And uh, that brings us to duties, which I'll talk about in a minute. But back to the red barn. On the each end of the barn, there was a toilet. And the boys' toilet was on the east end. The, the barn sat lengthwise east and west. And so the boys' toilet was on the east end, and the girls' toilet was on the west end. And they were just regular old outdoor toilets, except they happened to be built right on to the barn, so it was all one building. It wasn't, the toilets weren't separate. And the barn had a little manger in it and it had a dirt floor. But in my time, other than maybe once or twice a year just for fun, kids didn't ride horses. But the barn was built, of course, for the day that kids did ride horses. And so uh, we only used the barn for playtime. Anyhow, that was the barn and the cistern. And there were um, 13 kids when I was here, all eight grades at one point.
but quite often you would have five or six or seven grades. And there were times when I only had six or seven grades. But how many, just for fun, how many went to a rural school? Everybody in here, so I don't dare to tell tales. <laughs> so last year I didn't have all, oh, here's come some people that can fit into these small size desks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> last year I had people in here that had not attended rural schools. So you all, you know how they worked. You know, they were, um, I would call first grade reading. And if you were in first grade, I had a right here. The map has fallen down apparently onto the little recitation bench, but that usually sat in here, kitty corner. And then I would ask you to read your story. And if you could read it well, then we had reading for the first three grades twice a day. And then I'd give you maybe four or five more pages uh, for you to read for the afternoon reading class. And then I would call up the second grade and then the third grade or fourth grade, <clears throat> right in a row. And they all came up and spent their time up here. And I, of course, asked them some questions about what the story was about and, and um, what they liked about it. And, and then, as a rule, there was a, and I don't think there's any workbooks, <clears throat> this is a math book, but there was a reading workbook, too, that would go with the storybook. And along with assigning some more pages to read, for the first three grades, usually up, upper grades didn't have workbooks, but they would have... A workbook that went with a reading book that had appropriate uh, pages to go with the story that they could there would be some coloring and, and some questions in there to see how well they had read their story and so we did that generally the first period and the first period went from 9 until 10 15 as a rule that was <clears throat> that could vary that depended upon the teacher, just how she set up the schedule. And then at 10.15, we'd all get the, at all eight grades, got to go outside to play for 15 minutes. And then the teacher would go and stand by the door, and, and they'd all come in. And then we'd have math. Well, we didn't call it math, though. Back in the country school, we called it arithmetic. So now they call it math, but they would come in for arithmetic. And we did the same thing for each class. We'd call up the first grade and they'd bring their, their workbooks up and uh, they would show me what they had done. And maybe they had this page. And I would go over it and we would check it together, right and wrong and right well, and, and visit about it. What did you do wrong here? How come this isn't the right answer? Let's, and most of the time, many of the times, it was just a careless mistake. So if you'd question them, they could say, oh no, that's not six, that's seven. And so they could figure it out pretty fast. And so we would correct their, their math. And usually the first three grades and sometimes five grades would have a workbook. The upper grades had textbooks and like this, except this is not a math book, but a book like this, and, and maybe I assign page 50, do the first 20 problems, or do the odd problems, or the even problems, or whatever. And if it was something new, <clears throat> I would take time to explain to them how to do it, and maybe before they went back to the desk, we'd do a couple on the blackboard to make sure that they had the, they knew what to do and how to carry on, and, and then, they would go back to their, their desk and do that. And quite often, <clears throat> that second period, we had spelling. It, spelling didn't have its own period as a rule. It was quite often, however, we were, could work it in, you know, either in the morning or maybe after math. And then we'd have a full noon hour if we chose to. And, and I think most of the country schools did have a full noon hour. Uh, that was left up to the teacher's discretion. However, you know, if she chose to have a 45-minute noon hour and it was okay with the school board, that could be done, and then the kids would get out in the quarter to four instead of four. Or sometimes we had school from 8.30 to 
um, I think most of the time when I went to school, it was just nine to four. Because we were farm kids, and a lot of the farm kids had chores to do before they went to school. And so they didn't go to school as a rule much before nine because otherwise they wouldn't get the milking done and the pigs fed and the chickens taken care of and all the other things they had to do. The, uh, in my case, it was uh, we had to wash and wipe the, the separator before I could go to school. So there were things to do before we went to school. And so most of the time, we did not go to school before nine o'clock. <clears throat> and then, of course, after lunch and... Lunch was, a, or lunch was, took us probably five to 10 minutes to eat our lunch, then we had all the rest of the time to play. And right across from the school, there was a road, of course, in front of the school, but on the other side of this uh, road, there were hills over there. And so um, they weren't as strict about kids doing things like that back when I went to school as they are now. We used to bring our skis and our sleds and things like that. And in the winter time, the hills would be covered with snow and we would spend the whole noon hour over there. And, and uh, of course the teacher would stand outside then about five minutes to one and ring the bell. We'd come and um, you can imagine, we had wet hands. And this, <clears throat> this wasn't the stove we had but we had all our wet gloves on top of the stove. They happened to be the same gloves that we wore to do chores in. So as they dried, what do you think maybe the schoolroom smelled like? <laughs> maybe kind of like a barn, maybe? It kind of did, but we were farm kids and we, did, we didn't mind that smell. We were used to that, that, that was, uh, what we put up with day in and day out, and we didn't even think anything about it. And sometimes if we, we uh, wanted, maybe mom had a little hot dish over, left over from supper, we could, <clears throat> instead of sandwiches and an apple, we could also put a little hot dish in a little pan on the oven, maybe at 11 o'clock, and it would be warm for dinner. Also, uh, the kids were kind of all worked up and tired and everything after the noon hour and so the teacher took a storybook not not well this is a storybook I guess and most of the time she would read a story to the kids for maybe 10 12 minutes to kind of get them relaxed and it was a it would be an appropriate story for all age levels so you know they and then we'd read a little bit every day maybe three or four or five pages each day and when that book was finished we'd read another book and so the kids always enjoyed the little story time for about 10, 12 minutes after, after their hard play during the noon hour. Well then by that time they were relaxed and it was time for language. And that's what we called it then too. We didn't call it English, we called it language. And so they would come in and we'd have language class and it's the same thing as what you call English now. And it was about nouns and verbs and periods and question marks and all the things that you learn about in English. And uh, <clears throat> that period went from one o'clock until about two o'clock, 2.15 I think it was maybe. That depended on the teacher too. It was whenever we said it, it was the same day after day, but I think maybe 2.15. And then we had another recess break. And for those of you that are in town school now, it's hard for you to imagine and even fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth graders got to go out and play. And we had all kinds of games we played. On the winter time, we pay, played fox and goose along. We didn't, of course, couldn't go back over on the, the hill for recess. That wasn't long enough time. So we'd play tag, fox and goose. This <coughs> building was a great building for anti I over. You know, we could get the ball over the top of this building real easy. We played anti I over and and oh, we played a game the last couple out where we'd pair up and, and the leader would call the last couple out and the two would come out and try not to get caught before they joined hands again. And, and uh, I don't even remember all the games, but we probably had 15, 20 games that we played along with the ball. And you know, one of the favorite things to do for kids in the spring and in the fall, uh, this 
ground around the schoolhouse would all grow up, there's that pep again, <laughs> to tall grass in the summer. And of course, it was, it was perfect habitat for gophers. And so comes the, or the school board or, or one of the parents would mow the grass and clean it all up by fall, but the gopher holes were still around. And we'd be playing ball and some kid would say, gopher! Everybody had dropped their bats and their balls and somebody would go to the cistern and get a pail of water and we'd dump it and everybody would go get a bat and stand there like this over the gopher hole and somebody would pour the water down the gopher hole. Well, most of the time, he didn't last. You know, it wasn't one bang and we had the gopher. And, and uh, it wasn't when I was a student here, but it was when I was teaching that down in the ditch, the kids got the idea that they would make a gopher cemetery. So each time that they killed a gopher, they put him in a little grave. So we had, and then they made a little, out of, they find, found a stone or something and made a little headstone for it. So in the ditch down along the road, we had a gopher cemetery. So that was something they did for fun. And uh, so now we've gotten to the last recess and we come back in after the last recess and that's time for history and science. And most of the time when we had two classes, in one time slot, we couldn't do them every day. So maybe we had, or geography, maybe we had geography Monday and Wednesday and science on Tuesday and Thursday or something like that. And then Friday, that last period of the day, we always had art. And uh, oh, our rooms were all decorated. We had pictures that we did on Friday all the way around the room and art for Mother's Day and for Christmas, quite often for a couple of weeks, consisted of some cute little gift that we made mom for Mother's Day or for Christmas. It wasn't just a picture we hung on the wall. It was something special that we made for mom for Mother's Day or for Christmas. And so then it was time to go home. <clears throat> I skipped something in the morning, but I'll finish after I tell you about duties. Every student here had a duty. And some of them maybe had to clean the erasers and they'd take a couple of erasers and take them outside and bang them together and that'd get all the chalk dust out of them and put them back so they were all ready to go the next day and wash off the blackboards. Someone took down the flag, someone swept the floor, um, and someone emptied the water and made sure the sink, the wash basin, we didn't have a sink, we used a wash basin. And every student brought home, brought to school a towel from home. So each student had their own towel. It wasn't a paper towel. It was a real bath towel or a hand towel or something that mom sent to school. And they used that every day, the same towel. And then on Friday, they'd all take their towels home and on Monday they'd come back with a nice fresh towel. And this was true with their drinking glass too. Everyone had their own drinking glass because we had a, a cooler and someone had the duty to go get the water in the morning out of the cistern, fill the cooler, and so we would come up with our little glass and push the button and that's how we got our water. We didn't have a faucet. We didn't have electricity. When I was in school as a student, we did when I was a teacher here. And maybe once or twice a year, uh, it would get stormy and it would be real dark outside and we had we had more than that one I think we had at least two there may have been four but I think we only had two and we would light those lamps like it's up beside the and that was our light we didn't have electricity when I was teaching <clears throat> we did have electricity but when I was a student we didn't and then if someone would get sick um, the teacher would there was um, a farm just a little ways across the field, probably not more than a block away or two blocks away. And the teacher would get in the car and she'd tell the students to be the seventh and eighth graders in particular to keep an eye on things. And we'd go up, I, the teacher would go up to the farm 
and call mom and dad and say, Susie Q is sick and you need to come and get her. And so the students were in the schoolhouse all by themselves. And I'm assuming that when I was teaching, they were all well behaved. I know when I was a student and uh, the teacher left us alone, we never got out of our desk. We might talk, we might have talked. You know, that was kind of a free time when we didn't have to have our nose in the book. So we might have talked, but no one ever got rowdy or got out of their desk or got into any trouble. We just behaved ourselves. And the teacher would come back and everything would be in order. And so <clears throat> what I didn't do when I started is to start out the day. When we first sat down in our desk in the morning, we had what we call a health check. And on the wall, there was a poster with everyone's name on it, about so big. And we would have a health check, and that would be someone's duty. They would be the health person for that particular month, maybe. And they would go around to each student, and we'd sit there like this. And they'd check our fingernails to make sure we had clean fingernails. And they'd ask, did you wash your hands? Did you brush your teeth? And of course, they could see if we combed our hair. And did you eat breakfast? And there were a few questions. And if we answered all the questions correctly, like we were supposed to, we got a star for that day. And so at the end of the month, or in, in back in those days, Nancy's out there, so she's going to correct me if I'm wrong, so I don't dare to make a mistake here. Um, back in those days, the charts usually went for six weeks because our school year was broken down into six six-week periods. So 36 weeks of school, six weeks at a time. And then the person that had the, the most stars would get a prize. And you know, what the prize quite often was was a candy bar or something like that. And you know what candy bars cost back then? Just a nickel. So by today's standard, that wouldn't be very much of a prize, but we thought we had won the lottery when we got a candy bar for having the best health record. So, you know, that was very important. I don't know if a candy bar was maybe the most, the healthiest thing we could give for, get for a health check, but anyhow, that was the easiest and, and probably the most appreciated. And then we had special programs throughout the year. Um, we had the first part of the, oh, well, in the fall, when school first began, we quite often that whole oh, month, while the weather was still nice, a month or four or five weeks into school, we would either be invited to another school or we would invite another school to play ball. We'd have a challenge ball game. And uh, we would do that on Friday afternoon in place of our art class. In fact, we might even do it a little earlier. Maybe we'd skip a class or two. If maybe we'd start at 1.30 or something like that on Friday afternoon and challenge another, another school to a ball game. And it didn't seem, as I remember, to make much difference who won. We were just happy to be together and play ball and have lunch and, of course, Everybody wanted to win, but it, it didn't seem to be a big deal if you didn't. We just had a good time doing it. Well, then along came October, and it was Halloween. And I don't think when I was in school, I even knew about such a thing as tricks and treating. I don't think that wasn't part of what I grew up with, but we had a Halloween party at school. And so we played some games and had some treats, and so that was kind of special. The next thing we did shortly after Halloween, we started talking about Christmas. And uh, we were talking about our Christmas programs and, and the teacher was busy ordering books with plays and recitations and songs. We sang Christmas songs and, and did all that for the Christmas program, which we usually planned for about an hour, close to an hour, maybe 50 minutes or so. Every child participated, not just one time. They participated many times in that Christmas program. You know, they might be in a skit or a play, or, and they might have a recitation of their own, and they, they always, every student sang songs. And this school didn't have a stage. Some of the nice brick schools had, actually, they had a, a stage that was a little higher. But this one, we ran, um, we each, each family brought a sheet, a white bed sheet. And there's, I see there's a hook up there by that shade. And we strung a wire from that window to that window. 
and then kitty corner from those windows to the door, that was, that was our dressing room back in those corners. And so across we had the sheets that we brought from home. And of course we had them all decorated with artwork and we made them pretty and, and uh, all the moms and dads and anyone in the school district, everyone came. And sometimes grandmas and grandpas could come and you look at this and think, I don't know how that would work, but it seemed like we got everyone in here. <laughs> we didn't have to leave anyone outside. They all, we had chairs and everyone was here. And of course, the moms fixed something for lunch and it was like Thanksgiving dinner. We had sandwiches and cake and oh, all good things that we did after the school program. And, and uh, that was usually set up out there in the porch. And so we had lunch and, and all that to go with it. And then we went through the school year a little further and we came to Valentine's and we had a Valentine's party. And usually the children together made a nice Valentine box and everyone brought a Valentine for everyone in the school. They didn't draw names, oh, they did draw names for Christmas presents. So we, you, every student got a present from someone who drew their name. And then Valentine's, you brought a Valentine for everyone. So if there were 10 kids in school, you went home with 10 Valentines. And oh, we treasured those. Those were really neat. And we had, a, again, we had a party and we had cookies and, and I don't remember, sandwiches maybe, but treats anyhow. And then as we got close to the end of the year, there was Mother's Day. We really made nice gifts for Mother's Day. We worked on those for several weeks. And uh, I know I still have one of my Mother's Day presents down in the basement. It's, it's a light bulb and it has plastic pieces around it and it looks like a rose. So, and you plug it in and it's got a little switch on it and when you turn it on, it looks like a, mine's orange, looks like an orange rose in the light socket. And so, um, we made special presents for mom for Mother's Day. And then we had the end of the school year and all the parents came and all the neighbors came and we had a big picnic and I think some maybe had them at the school, but we usually went to the park as a rule. We went, sometimes we went to Lake Campbell and I have a picture of being up at Lake Campbell with the school. And I don't remember if it was this one or the old school, but there all the mothers are sitting at the picnic table visiting and all of them have a nice hat on because they probably wore the same thing that they wore to church that morning. They just came to the picnic that way and ladies wore hats. And so here I have a picture of all these moms sitting there at the picnic table with hats on. They were, that was, they were dressed up. And so uh, that's pretty much uh, what I have to tell you. Uh, speaking of, of uh, books, each student had to give a book report every six weeks. That was important, you had to read at least one book. So that meant that every child in the school would have read six books by the end of the, you could have read a lot more, you might have read 20, but you had to read that many because you would have to have a book report at the end of every six weeks. So now I'm just going to uh, quit talking and ask if there are any questions. If you have questions, there's probably lots of things I didn't tell you that you would like to know. And so if you have a question or a comment, all of you went to country school, so you can comment on what I left out. And I'm looking at three people that never, four people that never went to country school or will never go to country school. There's Nina Sue out there and she went to country school. I thought I noticed the desk trunk. The desk trunk, yeah, I know. The desk trunk. Yeah. I don't know, I haven't tried out the teacher's desk. I don't know if that one's shrunk. That one's probably shrunk too, because uh, I know I haven't. Hi, Lonnie. <laughs> and so, any com and it may be not questions, comments. Um, you know, anyone have a story from country school? I, it was, I can't tell you the year I was in, in country school, but they had government products and it was dried prunes. Okay. And just before noon, the teacher put two on each of our desks. 
so everybody would have one at lunch. Okay. Well, I was a naughty girl and I couldn't wait, so I ate one. Well, I had to stand in the corner by the piano. Till, All right. Till the period was over. <laughs> That's, yes, for you younger ones, kids did get punished. I, they didn't get just a, oh, shame on you kind of thing. I mean, they made them, they punished them to the point where they remembered it and would not do it again. Mm -hmm. Another thing that popped into my mind was uh, I went to school during World War II, and probably some of you did, and on Friday during the fall, uh, quite often we skipped our art period and we went out and walked the road ditches and collected milkweed mm -hmm. pots mm -hmm. because the military could use the down or whatever you call that in the milkweed pods for uh, whatever. You know, parachutes. And parachutes. Oh, parachutes could be. I'm not sure exactly. Tin foil was also. We collected tin foil. I remember. And then another thing we did during World War II is we prepared little gift boxes for the servicemen, and in there we would put maybe a comb, and uh, I don't remember, just maybe a little tablet and a pencil and just little things. Um, the box probably wasn't much more than half this book size, but maybe a little deeper. And so you couldn't get a lot of, there were little gift boxes for our servicemen to more or less just to show appreciation for what they were doing for our country. And so that's kind of what this day is all about too. It's our Declaration of Independence. It's about the freedoms that we are, our forefathers, uh, put together for us that we might be a free country and enjoy our freedoms. That's, we're so blessed to think that we have the freedoms that other people in other countries don't have. So just think about that every day. Just think, I'm, I live in a free country, I'm free. And so uh, we really, we really appreciate what our military does for us or have, has done and, and is doing. Any more questions? Any comments, Nancy? Be careful about the stories you tell now. I rode a horse to school. Oh, you did ride a horse to school. Okay. And, well, and we took the pony cart, put her on a pony cart. Okay. We had a barn, yeah, just outside here. In the That's why I said about like where that maple stands. Yeah. Maybe and a little further, but yeah. So she stayed in the barn. She got loose one day and went home without us. But okay. Uh, <laughs> we either rode a bike or, or rode a horse to school. Yeah, quite a few kids rode a bike. I rode a bike after I was in the upper grades. And uh, how about you, Nina Sue? Any stories that you want to tell? Nina Sue didn't go to the school. She went to a different yeah, I, I either rode a bike or rode horse to school, too. And we always played Annie I over the barn and for games at the end. We had nice long recesses. And I wasn't in here for all of it, but did you uh, tell about the competition? Uh, in the spring or in the in the summer, when the kids, the school, schools would get together and play each other for a, a, a softball game. Softball game, like that. yes, we yeah. did that. So Sometimes, yeah. usually in the fall and in the spring, we usually yeah. had two ball games per year, mm -hmm. just for fun. Um, what school did you go to? Me? Yeah, Bell. Bell. You went to Bell. Uh -huh. How about you? You went to town school always, didn't you? No, no, I went to Bell. Oh, no, I was, I was one back. Okay, yeah, yeah Rosemary left home school. Yeah. Rosemary was yeah. Ronda Bell. Yeah. And Sandy, I think it was country, or town yeah. school when you were, yes. yeah. Margaret went to Coleman. We started at Bell. Yeah. We started yeah. at Bell. Dorothy went to Coleman. How about you? Keith. Keith and? Oh, Minnesota. You lived at, and did you go to country school in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wayne went to Smith. I went to here, of course. and. I, was, I went to Vance. Lonnie was in Tid. Lonnie was in Tid. That was actually the district that my parents' farm was in, was in the Tid district. But in 1941, when I started school, the road going uh, east and west past Tid school hadn't been graded very well. And it was a bad road. It was muddy when it was muddy, and it was snow packed and, and blocked when it was snowy. And the same thing to Jones if you took the lower road, but you could uh, go all the way to the Ward Road and come into Jones. You could go north to the Ward Road, go down the Ward Road and come in. So 
My parents thought that if I went to the Jones District, I could probably always get to school, which I always did. Where if I had gone to 10, that there would be days that they wouldn't be able to get me to 10. And so he asked, my dad asked the school board if it would be okay if I came here to school. And they said, sure, and, you know. People didn't worry about little things back in those days. So yeah, you can, you can come to Jones School. And so that's why I came to Jones School instead of 10. Had I gone to 10, I would, would have been there with quite a few of my cousins. So it's better I went to Jones. I was the only child in my grade all eight years. Okay. Oh, Margaret was too. And I, I would teach the first, second, third grade while the teacher had older kids because I was only the only one in my class and there was like 20 some, 20 to 30 kids and so forth. I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to tell that. That, you know, for the younger kids that, okay, when you're having fifth, sixth grade class and the first and second graders have a question, they raise their hand and usually the seventh and eighth graders, one or the other, yeah. or if there was one very dependable, you know, you would give them permission. I would have, I would give them flashcards <coughs> and I would have the reading. And spelling probably, pronounced yeah, spelling yeah. words. Yeah. There's uh, quite often, you know, uh, for the bigger schools, even for a small school, uh, the teacher utilized the seventh and eighth graders to uh, help. They could go around and, and uh, <coughs> assess the kids if they, you know, maybe they didn't know how to pronounce a word. So then Margaret would get up out of her desk and come over and they'd say, what's this word? And Margaret would tell them and the teacher could go on without being interrupted with the class that was in session. And so, um, and not only that, when you're teaching science or geography or history, the first graders heard the eighth graders talk about Europe and Japan and whatever, or the, the history lessons about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and, and those lessons. Okay, they heard that story over again when they were in the second grade, when the eighth graders talked about it. And the third and the fourth and all the way up. And so by the time they were eighth graders, they'd already heard these stories seven times. And so, you know, I think like history and geography and science and things that you kind of have to um, get stuck in your head and, and memorize, I think it was, in a way, it was easier for the country kids because they had heard these stories over and over and over and over. And so in that sense of the word, the country schools, and you know, um, when I know, the kids that I know of that made the transition from country school to town schools, Buzz right through it, never had any problem. They were, you know, you kind of expected, uh, some people kind of expected that the old country hicks were gonna have trouble when they came to town. Uh-uh, they didn't. They were, they were ready to go and they didn't have any problem. They went right from the country school right into town school and they were, they were ready. They were, in some cases, once in a while, they were a little bit ahead because one child or two in a class had the advantage sometimes there were 25 in a class, so. So, I think it was a good education. Oh, it was a wonderful education as far as I'm concerned. I'm glad for the opportunity. I think I, I feel blessed because of it. Thank you, Arlene. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.